Richard, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Eric. So, Richard, we're, we're talking in mid-June, and David Sachs just hosted a fundraiser for Donald Trump that had a surprising amount of Silicon Valley show it. You know, in, in 2016 and even in 2020, there was barely any Trump support or certainly no explicit Trump support. But it's, it feels like there's now actual Silicon Valley support for Trump. It's still probably a minority, but among a lot of the CEOs I know or, or venture capitalists, um, it's, it's much more than I would have expected. And it, it, the, the reasons they'll claim is because they like Trump's policies on the economy. They like Trump's pers- uh, foreign policy um, approach. And he's actually, you know, said some good things about crypto and AI and just generally seems more kind of uh, encouraging of, of Silicon Valley. They don't like his aesthetics or they don't like being seen to support his, uh, his aesthetics or, or morals, um, but uh, they're willing to, to bite the bullet this time. What do, you, uh, what, what, do you, what do you make of it? Yeah, it's sort of one of those things that's overdetermined. Uh, so the Silicon Valley, a lot of people didn't like wokeness. A lot of people were sort of fed up with what's going on in San Francisco. Uh, at the same time, you know, the liberals have gone sort of, uh, the Democrats have gone uh, further left on economics, just the way they talk about rich people um, and so forth has just become sort of, you know, even Biden's coming up you know, saying things that'll never, uh, that'll never get passed, but things like a wealth tax. I mean, these things are getting, you know, floated around like they're serious ideas. And then there were in a time of sort of ferment and, uh, 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 technological innovation. And just the Democrats have become sort of, uh, reflexively anti-tech and pro, uh, regulation. Uh, you talk about AI and you talk about crypto. Yeah. It's just, it's just reflective at this point, whatever technology comes about. Um, you know, a small example that some people might have missed is, uh, prediction markets. So, uh, the Democrats on the CFTC, the ones appointed by Democrats, the commissioners all vote, uh, all voted recently to basically ban, uh, most kinds of prediction markets and the two Republicans were against it. Now, nobody, we don't see that as a hot button political issue. Um, but it's, you know, there, there's a kind of just a, a reflexive anti-market, uh, sort of force on the left. So that's there. Uh, you know, I think Trump is just sort of, you know, benefited from not being on Twitter. I mean, if you follow the things he says on true social, it's just, it's just insane. I mean, he's getting sort of crazier and crazier, but I get, I think these people just don't, don't see it. I mean, they're all on Twitter all day. Um, and I, I wonder what it would be like if Trump was on, uh, was on Twitter himself and talking about, you know, locking up all his enemies and just coming across as a, as a crazy person. Uh, but he's helped a little bit by that. You know, the, the narrative from the media about Trump, um, went from he's so intolerant uh, in 2016 to like he's a threat to democracy in in 2024, and I, I think that I think the threat to democracy narrative isn't that ridiculous. But people from what I've seen in Silicon Valley who are right leaning uh, just don't have don't buy that at all. Um, and so maybe just that focus on Trump maybe that's helping Trump um, in the general election too. But you know, the idea that Trump is sort of a racist and a, and a, a this kind of that kind of phobe I mean that's sort of fallen by the wayside. Yeah. And you, you had a post where you talked about your political evolution. And if I was to summarize, you know, you've, uh, you were very critical of, of wokeness and, and still remain sort of, um, you know, critical of certainly left wing economics, but then also any sort of egalitarian um, sort of uh, thinking by decree. But you've sort of got disillusioned by the right, too, because of its a sort of embrace of, of Russia and, and Putin during Ukraine, but then also or probably more prominently because of its uh, sort of response to COVID with the uh, sort of anti-vax stuff. But then more broadly, just what that is evidence for for you is just this this IQ problem or this human culture problem where the right is both dumber and kind of less ethical in in your view is is that accurate, or how would you? Uh, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, there's a lot there. I'm not really a conservative, and I, I think where where I agree with conservatives, it's often just because they reflexively um, uh, oppose the left. So I don't think a lot of Republican voters are necessarily pro technology, or they like change, or anything like that. I think they're uh, hostile to change, maybe more hostile to change than uh, a lot of the voters on the left. <clears throat> You know, they're just sort of motivated by cultural grievances and they don't like the people uh, who are running uh, society. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of what's motivating, I think, Republican base and the Republican elite are sort of, you know, they cater to this and they partly believe in this. But then they have these sort of classical uh, liberal ideas, too, at the top. Um, 
you know, the, the, uh, it's basically, it's nationalism. And I think we've seen, I think we've seen a comeback of sort of the influence of the religious right. I mean, it's always been there, but it's just become more uh, prominent and visible uh, since, since the Dobbs decision. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I think I had a tendency once to maybe sort of gloss over. And I think that these Silicon Valley guys, I think a lot of them are doing this too. I think people, people do this in general. People are, um, when they become tribal and they like one side or the other, they will, even if they don't switch their opinion on every single issue to uh, accord with their new, uh, their, their new uh, group, they will uh, often just sort of elide, you know, sort of, or just look away at the differences or try to explain them away and say, Oh, well, but actually there's a good point or there's some political reason, or this is thing that I actually don't agree with is somehow justified. And I think one thing I, don't do uh, I do much less than other people is any anything like that uh, right and I think just sort of realizing like wow there's a lot of things I see conservatives doing you know that are just like either wrong ideologically I just think morally are wrong are just like stupid right so the stupid category you have like the anti-vax thing which is just stupid which is really taken over the Republican Party I see smart people Silicon Valley smart people just saying bad things about the vaccine and you know they're just they're just going along with this I mean this is I don't think they've looked much into the issue um, and then some things are like a value thing like the uh, you know like the the, the, the a question of abortion, um, the question of uh, uh, euthanasia. I've seen the freak out over the Canadian program, which if you look at the data is completely sensible and, and humane. Um, and so, yeah, these are sort of, I, I don't know, I, like, if I change that much uh, I, in my political journey, but it's more like a coming realization, like, wow, there's a lot here on the right that I don't like. Yeah. It's, it's fair to say you're sort of a a free market biorealist, which is to say whichever party is more market oriented or more liberty oriented while also taking into account just facts about uh, human nature um, and how uh, yeah. different groups. Uh, you know, you know, I, yeah, I don't even care. I mean, I don't even care about the latter point. You can think whatever you want about different groups and why they you know, end up one way or the other. It's there. I, I, you know, I really think that this is sort of, you should inform politics based on uh, scientific views because translating scientific views to policy um, is a long way. There's an essay I'm, I'm going to write, uh, Eric, uh, and it's might, might, or might not be out by the time uh, this gets released. But I think that one thing, like one thing by instinctual conservatism, I think a lot of conservatives are like this. Whenever I watch a movie or like a clip or a news reel or something from the eighties or nineties, the thing that angers me is, you know, the people are thinner and they don't have tattoos and they don't um, have weird colored hair. And like, I think a lot of people become reactionaries just that way. They remember that people didn't look so stupid and weird when they were younger. And then they just become a, Repu a Republican and they think, oh, you know, Biden is, um, you know, Biden is uh, destroying the country by importing illegal immigrants and the inflation is out of control and, you know, and make America great again. And it, like, there's no connection with this thing and, you know, all your views that you've now um, that you've now come to. But it's just a sort of a, a reaction. And so I think that my conservatism is something that I share, I think, an instinct with a lot of conservatives. Um, but they haven't figured out that what the, the political causes they care about are not going to bring back what they like and, and is not going to affect sort of the policy. You know, the policy is not the sort of battle, the sort of plane on which they've lost. Um, and I think I, I, I think I share that uh, with them, like the concern, but there's just like not a lot of serious thinking of like why this happened and what we're going to do about it. Right. And um, why this happened, you cover a lot in your, in your book. Um, but how do you think you, you've talked about the IQ problem or sort of the human capital problem on the right? What, what do you think are the best levers to try to change that? Um, or, or how could you imagine that be, that being changed? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like such a trite answer. Like you just have to sort of, yeah, I don't know because this is sort of independent, you know, it's the, you know, first of all, I, I mean, I think there's sh like the, the way that happened with the left, it was sort of organically. I mean, it was, I think it was just sort of we we funded uh, education and we had mass education. And we had people going to college, and then there was just sort of a natural tendency for the kind of people who wanted to work. Uh, you know, they're affect government employees if you work for a public university. I mean, not technically you're technically a scholar. I mean, technically you are uh, uh, you are a government employee, but we don't think of them that way. But that's what they are, and you know, there's just a natural sort of tendency. I think this happened in the you know in the 
second half of the 20th century for those people to drift left towards to, uh, towards a kind of uh, uh, statism. Um, and so a human capital problem is just like IQ, right versus left. It wasn't bad, you know, during when Mitt Romney was the nominee, college educated whites uh, voting majority uh, for Mitt Romney. Um, this is something that's very uh, kind of specific to the Trump era. Now, Romney had a difficult time in that primary because the voters, this this thing was happening, this kind of uh, education polarization uh, was happening. And so you have one party, which is like, you know, the angry, <laughs> the angry people, the angry, I, you know, I, I, I always imagine the Republican base is sort of uh, old people living on social security checks, just like staring at the TV and getting angry. Right or you know the the you know the uh, the, the Facebook uh, boober boober poster right and that just you know that's just not seen as appealing to a lot of people who are young and smart uh, and idealistic um, you know I think that it has to sort of be top down there's not an organic uh, there's not like an organic um, demand would it, for would like it a naturally regime. happen if Vivek or Elon was a presidential candidate like Trump's going to die at some point. And yeah. who, who, who do you think just a young? I mean, smart yes. The who is who is on the top? Who is the representative of the uh, of sort of each side is is very important. So yeah, I think Elon Musk probably you know uh, encouraged some people to find their courage and uh, become more uh, you know open in their uh, sort of more conservative political views. So sure, if Elon Musk you know can't run for president, uh, obviously, but uh, if he could and he was sort of the face of conservatism. Uh, yeah, that that would help, but I, I think the nature of the, like you know, I think the left, you know, they attract people who will be happy to make fifty thousand dollars a year writing hit pieces for the Guardian about this conference had this speaker who once said this bad thing, and they were associated with this person. And conservatism doesn't have that. I mean, that's that's partly human capital. It's human capital. You know, it's activism. It's journalism slash activism, uh, and the left has that. And I think that's sort of inha- inherent to sort of what the left is at that point. And so that I think is not going to be solved. I did write a piece uh, you probably saw called coping with low human capital. You know, the, 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 the path is, I don't think to recapture media and academia. I think those things are going to be what they are. Um, it's just, you know, trying to find ways to sort of go around them and to sort of reconfigure sort of power relations in society and between institutions. Though, though it, it, it does seem that certainly the last few months there's been, uh, more of a challenge to academia. I don't, I don't know if you would call that going around it, but attempts to delegitimize it or or or, or challenge it in some way. And, and similarly, or, or maybe differently in media, there does seem to be a more emerging, you know, uh, sort of right wing counter elite, you know, form of media, which aims. Yeah. To- and Twitter, I mean, Twitter has sort of, I mean, Twitter was yeah. on the side of the left and then Elon yeah. bought it. And now Twitter, I mean, suppresses links, which I don't, I don't like. I mean, I, I want people to be able to read news stories and, uh, you know, for like people to be able to reach my sub stack and so forth. Uh, but it is sort of, it has taken a power away uh, from the, from the media. And yeah, you look at someone like, not all these things are good, but I mean, Joe Rogan, or you look at, uh, uh, you know, Nick Fuentes has just had a conference. I mean, it's really is out of, I mean, anyone could have a, uh, anyone could have an audience now. Um, and, you know, same thing with academia. I mean, like it's, uh, I mean, how much uh, influence do professors really have over students compared to all everything else that's going on in the social media these days? I don't know if it's that much or influence on uh, society. So I think these sort of uh, sort of stale uh, kind of established institutions, I, you know, I think that they're gradually losing power and what's, you know, gaining power is the internet Right. Um, and, you know, streamers and uh, other things. And then, you know, wherever the money goes, because when you have money, you can influence public opinion. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey, all Eric Torenberg here. I'm hearing more and more that founders want to get profitable and do more with less, especially with engineering. Listen, I love your 30 year old ex fang senior software engineer as much as the next guy. But honestly, I can't afford them anymore. Founders everywhere are trying to turn to global talent. But boy, is it a hassle to do at scale, from sourcing to interviewing to on-the-ground operations and management. That's why I teamed up with Sean Lanahan, who's been building engineering teams in Vietnam at a very high level for over five years to help you access global engineering without the headache. Squad, Sean's new company, takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent so you don't have to. With teams across Asia and South America, we can cover you no matter which time zone you operate in. Their engineers follow your process and use your tools. They work with React, Next.js, or your favorite front-end frameworks. 
And on the back end, they're experts at Node, Python, Java, and anything under the sun. Full disclosure, it's going to cost more than the random person you found on Upwork that's doing two hours of work per week but billing you for 40. But you'll get premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost. Our engineers are vetted top 1% talent and actually working hard for you every day. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Head to choose squad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. Hey everybody, if you don't already subscribe to the Media Empire's newsletter, you should. But that's not what I'm here to tell you about. The platform we use to power this and other Turpentine newsletters is called Beehive, and it's excellent. First of all, it was started by the same early team who helped build Morning Brew into a $75 million newsletter business. And they built Beehive to offer that same powerful functionality to anyone sending emails, from essayists to business owners. The platform is beautiful, their text editor is intuitive, and they help you scale your audience with custom growth features. Beehive has powerful tools to help you monetize your content. You can easily launch paid subscriptions or pursue an advertising model. The Beehive platform will even connect you to premium brands to sponsor your newsletter. Not only do we use them, but thousands of the top newsletters in the world also use them like Milk Road, Blockworks, Newsletter Operator, and so many more. Beehive's founder hooked up Media Empire's listeners with a sweet deal. Get 20% off for three months with code EMPIRES. Visit beehive.com, that's B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com to get started. Fast forward to the end of 2024. Think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If learning a new language is on your list, you absolutely need to check out Babbel. Babbel offers a range of learning tools, self-study app lessons, live classes, and even podcasts, which have always been my favorite way to learn. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel isn't just a game to kill time and make you feel like you're learning a language. It's not overly academic or rigid either. It's all about learning language for the real world. Babbel stands out because it's designed by real people using a modern conversational teaching approach. It's not always easy, nothing worth doing ever is, but it's straightforward and designed to help you start speaking in just three weeks. With Babbel, I was able to brush up on my intermediate Spanish to ramp up for travel to Argentina last year and was able to set clear goals based on how much time each week I wanted to practice. Join millions of Babbel language learners across all age groups. Here's a special limited time offer for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only at babbel.com slash Torenberg. That's babbel.com slash Torenberg, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Torenberg. Rules and restrictions may apply. You, you, you've written about how there's some element of, of religious thinking that just kind of repulses you or, or repels you because of the sort of illogical nature. And I think maybe Tucker Carlson has embodied this recently, um, judging by some of your tweets. Um, but I'm curious, you know, Tyler Cowen calls himself a pro-religious non-believer. Uh, yeah. do, do, you simply, do you have more appreciation for sort of them when it comes to, or, or in light of sort of the fertility statistics, um, when, you, when you look at certain, certain yeah. groups and how they procreate, and, and, and you've written a lot about our fertility crisis, um, yeah. is becoming religious potentially a solution or, or, or no? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, ways in which religion is a positive force on society. Now, there's some things that I just dislike, like the Catholic sort of philosophy of life. I wish we could excise that part um, for, you know, abortion and euthanasia, especially euthanasia. I just, I wrote a piece recently. I mean, I just have such a reaction to opposite to the idea that you government forces people to live uh, to me this is the fundamental the right to suicide is the first <laughs> is the first and most fundamental right deciding yes a you know a or b i exist or i don't exist this is the most fundamental right and given the state of society and like you know how people keep you know are lose their dignity and are uh, you know, hooked up to machines for decades and decades i mean i just think it's it's so important um, not that euthanasia is that life of an issue in the U.S., but I mean, their conservatives are so opposed to it, they're just following Canada, you know, very closely and then getting upset on what's going on uh, there. Uh, so there are things in, you know, conservatism that, you know, genuinely hurt people and are bad uh, for society. Um, and then instinctually, I'm not religious and I just don't have, you know, the ability to sort of sympathize or really just uh, put myself in the shoes of somebody who who has that has that worldview. It's just very difficult for me. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm a liberal and I understand not everyone is like me. And 
um, you know, religion often gives people comfort and it gives them community. And we've seen in years, I mean, we've seen the, you know, the increase in singledom and people not having children and not forming families and, you know, being lonely, even like num- things like number of friends is, is going down. We've seen sort of the dangers of not having some kind of coordination mechanisms uh, in society around which people can, you know, meet other people and form lives, everything from friendships to marriage and family and children. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not hostile to religion. I think it, you know, it has some bad effects on specific policy areas. Um, but I think if like society became more religious, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how I would <laughs> feel about that. It w- there would be good and bad things. I, you know, I wouldn't have an instinct. This was a terrible thing or a great thing. I wouldn't be, you know, that strongly in either direction. You, you wrote about, the, it, it, some things, this sort of idea of like the return philosophy, i.e. we need to go back to the 1950s, gets right and gets wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you think there's some sort of uh, line of statistics that say something like women were happier in the 50s. Um, and so you know, this is sort of Louise Perry sort of, you know, line of thinking. And then there was some people who respond to that and say, either that's not true, or even if that is true, either there is no going back or we shouldn't go back and would rather live in a world where we have a fertility crisis or people are just less happy, but at least they're more free. How do you react to that? Yeah, I mean, like the idea that women are, uh, you know, like the idea that you could just tell people do this and then you will be happy. It's, you know, in the 1950s, they didn't have a sort of, you know, they didn't have an idea of a, the possibility that it, it actually could be different. I don't think it just it struck people's mind that you would have a world where women and men are, you know, entering the labor force in equal numbers in their, in their early uh, 20s. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that marriage and family uh, do give people meaning. Um, I think that people should be encouraged to, you know, not get tattoos and not get fat and get married and have children and, you know, behave uh, in ways that are traditionally considered, uh, you know, acceptable or attractive for their own sex. I think we're wired uh, to sort of find that attractive in other people and then be happy with ourselves when we live up to those uh, to those uh, standards. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there is sort of, you know, there is a, something to this idea that like things got worse in some ways. Now in that piece, I argue that, um, you know, they, they, they become just like very stupid and just reject everything about modernity. They say, you, you know, they say that, uh, you know, because we focused too much on the economy, we were too materialistic. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't protect the jobs from the immigrants or, or some other, you know, some nonsense like that. There's always this implication that like, every single thing we did wrong or like material prosperity um, is the problem. And, and that I would, that I would reject. I mean, that's just not really based in reality. The, I want to go to Trump and I'm curious, you you mentioned earlier in this conversation that you actually um, do think there's some legitimacy to the idea that he is a real threat to democracy. It's interesting. Some people, you know, Peter Thiel famously said, you know, take him, uh, seriously, not literally. And, you know, some people will ascribe sort of this like hidden genius to him, <laughs> of, like or his instincts around sort of uh, the Middle East, his instincts around China. I uh, just kind of like early to different trends. Um, but then others will see kind of the obvious things that he says and say, wow, this person's really dumb or really vile or um, you know, I, really think, you know, I think to understand Trump, whether he's genius or, or an idiot, I, I think he is a legitimate genius when it comes to politics and his in- instinct for self-preservation and power. Does he have some secret wisdom about like international relations or something like that? Usually uh, not, but I was surprised actually, you know, to see like when the story came out of what he was doing after uh, the 2020 election and between that and January 6, I mean, it was really an organized effort to overturn the election. I, I studied his policy, you know, his sort of performance and policy areas. He didn't show that kind of sort of, you know, uh, uh, level of uh, attention to detail when he was trying to, you know, formulate a foreign policy or this or, or economic policy or this or that. It was when it came to like me, Trump, stay in power. He was sort of a genius at this. And then the other thing he did was a genius. I mean, just the way he sort of played the Republican Party. He made everyone, you know, I've written about this. He, he made everyone say that he was the legitimate president, that he won 2020. He made them afraid to say anything different. And then uh, and then 2024 comes along. Everyone is running against Trump. They've spent four years saying Trump is the legitimate president and the whole deep state is out to get him because he is the only person who threatens them. And they're still saying this during the campaign, basically. And like DeSantis, I mean, you know, when Trump gets indicted for the first time, for a few times, 
Trump attacks, you know, DeSantis attacks, it sounds like Trump, he attacks the prosecutor who's indicting him. How do you expect to knock the guy off like this? But I think there was some kind of genius, like I've got to, and not only that, not only he made people, I mean, he made people say that he went and he would endorse candidates or attack people based on whether they said, you know, he won the 2020 election, whether they went wrong with his idea about ideas about vote fraud. And this is really, this is just sort of, this is genius. I mean, he, he, basically dominated the party and basically stayed as its leader until 2024. I saw this. I mean, I, I, I talked about like, you're going to have to challenge him. He's just going to cruise to the nomination. You guys are treat him like a God. And you know, you think that like one day you're just going to say, okay, it's 2024. Now it's Iowa, New Hampshire. Oh, vote for me, by the way. Trump is great. But you know, look at me, DeSantis. I, 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 I passed a law that says don't teach gender identity to third graders. That's cool, right? Like, no, these people, you made it the Trump cult. Like they don't, they're not going to care what you, you know, what you did in Florida. So the man is the man is a, a genius i mean he is he is a savant at sort of controlling and manipulating um republicans and the, and the republican party i mean people didn't see this so uh you know mitch mcconnell i think either he said it or was reported about him that he could have voted uh, he could have tried to whip the votes to convict him after the second impeachment after uh january 6th stuff but they just assumed uh that he would just go away that after january 6th i mean you remember like all these all these companies were like saying they weren't going to donate to like Republicans who even voted not to certify the election. It was like, there was like the whole, all the walls were closing and everyone was like, Trump was such an embarrassment. Even people like on Tucker the next day would say, oh, you know, it's, it's so terrible. What happened, uh, what happened the other day? And they say, you know, we don't, we don't have to incur the wrath of the voters. We don't have to vote to convict him. He's just going away. This is the end of Trump. <laughs> they, they just, they don't see it. They've been, they've been fools since 2015. They've wanted him to go away. Uh, and so, yes, as you can tell, I'm very just sort of, uh, just sort of uh, amazed at Trump's, at my own genius, because I, I've predicted this sort of every step of the way, but Trump's genius too. He's definitely got that. Now, whether, you know, when it comes to policy, yeah, it's all over the place. I mean, he's basically, he doesn't care that much. <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's doing, you know, what, what he's going to do. Um, yeah, he's, I mean, he signed all those giant, you know, uh, COVID relief bells. I mean, he, you know, when the pressure is on, he'll just, you know, he says he's going to build the wall. He never builds the wall. I mean, with a, you know, how long, right? He gives the, the Federal Society the judges they want, and then McConnell confirms them. I mean, he's, he's the least, a path of least resistance and just sort of, you know, not doing anything too stupid, but just sort of, for, you know, doing the, uh, you know, just the path of least resistance in the policy area, but then genius, genius at uh, achieving and holding power. We, we, we still have plenty of time before the election, but you had to pick in mid-June, you have to put your odds on uh, Trump versus Biden. What, what would you put? And, and more importantly, how would you, if you had to guess or predict sort of the major differences between a, a Biden presidency and a Trump presidency in terms of its its impact on the U.S., um, wh- what might that be? Uh, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the betting markets are really confident about Trump. They give them 55, 60 percent. I, I tend to think that's a little, you know, I tend to think that's a little high, uh, but it's not too far off. You know, maybe I'll take the maybe I'll take the low end of that. And, you know, which way we go is maybe just whatever the econo- economic news in the coming months. Yeah, Trump has become, you know, he's like, uh, there's, a, it's a problem with Biden, because in all the polls, all the senators and running states do better than Biden is doing, they're all out running him. It's not that the polls show people love Trump. It's that Biden, people think Biden is senile. People think Biden is just completely out of it. I mean, I think that that's sort of what the left is uh, in denial about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a close race, but, you know, we, the polls could be off three or four points in either direction. That, that, that's a norm. That's a normal uh, polling miss. I don't have really uh, scores of, you know, you could say, you say, well, they missed, they underestimated Trump in 2016. They under, underestimated Trump in 2020. That logic is not good because in 2022, you know, we were saying they over, you know, they underestimated the Republicans uh, the last few times. And actually their polls were probably uh, underestimated the Democrats a bit in the, you know, in the last midterm. So you never know. You can, it's hard to predict the, uh, based on the, uh, the direction of the, um, the error. Um, and so, yeah, so what a Trump presidency or what a Biden presidency uh, means, um, you know, we're going to get some. You know, the technology sort of regulation, I think, is a big deal. So, you know, the uh, the administrative state can do a lot um, on things we've talked about, crypto prediction markets, AI. You're basically going to have a more of a laissez-faire uh, approach if the uh, Republicans are, are in power. <clears throat> uh, and that's also just sort of judges, um, you know, the, the really Republican control of the judiciary. I mean, you know, one of these other 
liberal judges might not, their health might not hold up or whatever. I mean, you're going to have four more years of Republicans, of Trump appointing judges and Republicans, if Trump wins the presidency, there's almost no way uh, they don't also have the Senate. Uh, and so, yeah, you're going to, you're going to get sort of, a, I think, a tech acceleration, accelerationism. I think you're going to get sort of Israel just being able to do what it wants in Gaza. I mean, I think that there's some confusion here about what kind of Trump, President Trump will be on Middle East policy. I, I think that if you paid any attention to the first administration, you should not be confused. And, uh, you know, if you're voting for Trump as sort of like the anti-war candidate in the Israel-Gaza situation, I mean, I think you're probably misinformed and you're probably going to be uh, disappointed there. Um, the China stuff, you know, probably, it's probably going to be, you know, less different than uh, most other areas. It seems like Democrats and Republicans both uh, want to get uh, tough on China. I'll be interested to <clears throat> to see what the cultural impact will be. I think, you know, so people will, you know, when Trump won in 2016, there were these giant uh, protests. Uh, we're watching them on the news and like New York City and all these all these places. Um, and people were really upset. And it sort of became the, you know, the, the cultural energy became frantic. You watch, you know, the Emmys or like a late night TV show. And it was all like, you know, we're living under fascism. We're all going to die, this and that. Um, and... You know, that was still there. I mean, 2020, it still hadn't burned out. 2020, obviously, we had George Floyd and we had, uh, you know, it was the, probably the peak of the craziness. <laughs> but I think that what happened was it was like a TV show that had the same cast of characters for too long and people lost interest. So we had Trump 2016, Trump 2020, Trump as a nominee in 2024. You have another threat of a Trump presidency. And I think it's like very hard for people to maintain that frantic energy for a long period of time. And so like the media is saying, oh my goodness, Trump is saying he's going to arrest all his enemies and this and that. And they're, they're freaking out about the people within uh, Washington and sort of the established media and, you know, uh, uh, government uh, uh, bureaucrats and employees and so forth. But the cultural energy is just not there. Like uh, Trump is like hanging out like at UFC. I mean, Trump is doing this. Trump is doing that. I mean, he's, he's hanging out with, a, I think it was, a, so, was it some streamer, Jake Paul or something. And yeah, yeah, and like 2020, that sort of would have been unthinkable. Like anyone would have been canceled. If, even though Trump was president, like if you hung out with the president, you would get sort of canceled. It was like the cultural force was like that strong. And he's just like, he's just there. He's just in the culture. He sort of became normalized and sort of harmless. Um, and so, yeah, we might be entering an era of like, I think this will happen if Biden wins uh, too, where it's just like, it's been the same cast of characters for too long, sort of the a frantic energy of, I don't know, 2014 to 2020, 2021 burned itself out. And, you know, I hope we have a, a somewhat less politicized era. Yeah. The, um, do you think Jews go to the right and uh, sort of as a, as, a, as a clear block or is it still mixed? Um, I would think so. I would think they would go more to the right. Um, there was a one poll I saw that s suggested not, but then I look I, at the end that got a lot of attention on Twitter that said they were, I don't know, still 75% going to vote for Biden or something like that. I would be surprised if that's true. I looked for some other polls and the results were much, much closer uh, than that. I mean, yeah, I mean, anecdotally, it seems, I mean, it, anecdotally, it, look, there's pe there's people whenever they're, they have some kind of ethnic background and it's involved in a uh, geopolitical conflict, a lot of people will have their politics sort of center around that issue, uh, right? And so, you know, traditionally it was Democrats and Republicans were about equal in their support for Israel. Now there is a, cle a clear partisan uh, uh, split and that has to have an influence. So anecdotally, we see people like Bill Ackman and so forth who say, I was, you know, I was a, a Democrat and now my eyes have been opened and I see this anti-Semitism and I see how it's connected to DEI and all this other stuff. You know, that's anecdotally, there's a few, a few of these guys. Um, I would be surprised if it didn't, uh, you know, affect the general po population. So I don't, I don't know, like, I think, you know, if, if Trump didn't get like 40% of Jews, I think I would be, I think I would be surprised. Who knows? I mean, Jews have a very high intermarriage rate. So, you know, there might be a lot of people now with, you know, uh, one eighth Jewish ancestry or something, and they're answering polls and they're, you know, they say they're Jewish, but then, you know, they're just liberal white people in other ways. Um, so, yeah, you'd have to look into that a little bit because the secular Jews had, you know, for a while have had an intermarriage rate of like 50%. So who actually is Jewish and what is the Jewish community is actually a, sort of a, a complicated question. Um, I think the most Jewish Jews, the ones who identify most with their community, uh, yeah, I'd be surprised if they didn't uh, shift Republican uh, in the coming years. Yeah, it's 
It's interesting. I um, I'm I'm Jewish. My dad is Israeli, and I find myself often disagreeing with American Jews a, a lot. I um, and sort of both axes. I find myself one proposing, you know, Israel to do you know more sort of um, aggressive things to protect itself than than American Jews are typically comfortable with. Or you know they typically want Israel to be more left wing than, than than I do, at, at, separate from even this conflict, um, or more secular even. At the same time, I um, I find that American Jews also uh, in the U.S. In my humble opinion, even before this crisis, um, sort of before October seventh, tend to inflate the concern of anti semitism. Yeah, um, and I I wonder if anti semitism in the U.S. Not to say Europe or elsewhere. It's just a, is mostly a form of anti-whiteness, but we've just been so conditioned to ignore anti-whiteness or, or sort of this power, you know, oppressor or oppressed. It just fits into the, you know, sort of kind of left wing um, sort of paradigm that Jews have often supported when it was other groups. Um, and this is why a lot of right wing people like Tucker Carlson, et cetera, are, are, are mad at Jews for sort of being hypocritical on this on this element. Do you are, do you sympathize with that sort of uh self-critique that I'm that I'm giving or, or, or what do you think? Yeah, the anti-Semitism thing. I mean, I, you know, I think it's a, just from a completely fair sort of neutral observer perspective, the idea that these protests on university campuses and so forth are motivated by anti-Semitism. I don't, I don't buy that at all. It's oppressor oppressed framework. It's seeing as, you know, whites versus uh, non-whites and like the number of things that, you know, you know, like there's all these protests and you can build a narrative from like individual videos. I mean, it's like, uh, I saw one guy, like this guy is like praised Hitler during this college protest. And it was like one black guy who looked like he probably wasn't even a student. He comes in, he says, you know, Hitler was right or something like that. And then everyone's like sort of looking around uncomfortably. It wasn't like every one of the protests was like chanting for Hitler because these are leftists. These these are leftists. I mean, they, it is a thing. They're not, you know, genocidal looking for the minority group to go bash their heads in. They, they see Palestinians as the victim and they fit it into their, um, they fit it into their worldview. Now, I mean, it's very interesting that you see, you know, Congress having hearings on anti-Semitism and invoking civil rights law and all this and saying, you know, there's a hostile environment for Jews. I think that's probably politically, you know, the smart thing to be doing because what, like, it's just the currency is like, who could be the biggest victim? And like, if you can say, okay, our group is, you know, the one being discriminated against, this is even going to reach a lot of Democrats um, who are Jewish or who are sympathetic to Israel. Uh, so it's a it's a smart political uh, strategy, but the idea that you know Jews are you know facing you know, I see cra you see crazy things I mean you see hysteria I mean it's like I saw one guy like you don't know how bad it can get in America come to Israel where you'll be safe like, I don't think you're going to be safer in Israel than America I think that you know anyone who thinks that is 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 sort of has lost their mind um, but yeah I, I think people do believe this though and that's bound to have a political impact. You know, this question is even uh, known. The streets call it victim blaming. But it is, you know, any curious person can't help but ask, why are Jews discriminated against everywhere they go? Is, mm -hmm. is it fair to say some combination of like they do so well, so people are jealous, but they're also so insular and, and really support each other. So people feel like they're not assimilating. And thus, you know, um, like what, what do you think? Or is it really there are no causal explanations that that are instructive or helpful what, why I mean, do we think? It's, it doesn't seem that you know a minority religious group in europe like middle east uh medieval europe that's like economically successful like i don't think there's a lot like you know people are xenophobic and they're jealous of successful groups and jews have been sort of a wandering minority uh without their own land who've done well in european countries i don't think it's that sort of um mysterious like the history of like anti-semitism in Europe. And then when there's, you know, and then when you have the enlightenment, when you move away from Christianity and sort of these, you know, pre-modern ways of looking at the world, uh, the anti-Semitism sort of clears up. So you have Napoleon and the American founders, and they were all, you know, either, you know, they were, they were, you know, philo-Semitic in many cases. Um, and so this is not, you know, that hard to explain. I think there's like, you know, there's like a anti-gypsy like anti prejudice. I mean, you have from the other direction, you have a minority group in Europe that's been poor and sort of, you know, uh, sort of de dependent on society or known for crime and stealing and so forth. And they're not well liked, but, you know, there's not a lot of gypsies in 
Hollywood or academia are writing books on anti-gypsyism. It's just a prejudice that's there. So it seems like a minority group, they do well or they do poorly. Uh, people, though, I think anti-gypsyism is probably just as universal as anti-Semitism. They're just not as successful. And so people don't uh, What about Asians? About it. Asians are also very successful. Are they as discriminated against or, or do they well, do Well, I mean, yeah, in places where they have a long history of being a successful minority. Yeah, I mean, in these uh, Southeast Asian countries. So it's another good example. You could just say when you're a minority group and you're, uh, uh, especially when there's a religious, you know, there's an ethnic difference. And especially when there's a religious difference, um, people don't like you. And then in the Muslim world, I mean, you do, you have the, you have the same thing and then you have sort of, you know, there's, there's parts of the Quran that are very sort of explicitly, you know, directly connected to anti-Semitism. You know, you're, well, much of your audience probably uh, knows the lines. And so, yeah, you give a religious sort of uh, sanction to it, um, then, yeah, it's, it's not too hard to explain. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Zooming out uh, a little bit, um, you wrote about how in, in one of your pieces, this idea of like, calling people demons is bad, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I've gone back and forth on this idea of like, you know, the midwit curve, right? Is it like, you know, the sort of, um, you know, excessive rationality, rationalism, like mistake theory as opposed to conflict theory. It feels like sort of the, the dismissively, it's sometimes dismissed as like Reddit, you know, Redditism or something um, approach to arguments. I'm not sure if that's on the, like the middle of the bell curve or the, the right side of the bell curve. Cause I've, I have very smart friends who are both more, you know, are both sides. Like one is evaluate everything on its merits. And the other is like, no, there's a, there's a side that's directionally right. And there's a side that is, is wrong and you need to be on the good side. And, and there's like a spectrum there. And I'm, I'm curious how you've, yeah. How you think about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, so I recently rereading a little bit of I had read the recommendation of a, a friend. I read a collection of essays called The Romantic Manifesto. And so I had read is probably one of the most uh, famous people for sort of painting a picture of villainry uh, that right wingers can really get behind and that appeals to them. And, you know, I think that when I hear <laughs> demon, you know, I, I think I'm more, it's my reaction is less about the sort of uh, uh, less about the, um, uh, sort of the idea of whether it's uh, you know it's 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 too much uh, too much um, of attacking the other side or too personal. More it represents a sort of uh, it more it represents a sort of pre modern sort of primitive worldview. Like Alex Jones, like you know it's not metaphorical. Like you have to check whether the person is metaphorical or literal. Like there's a clip I've seen of Alex Jones where he's like, no, no, they're literally demons. This is not a metaphor. I mean, he goes into it and he like, it gives detail. So a lot of these people believe that they're literal, literal demons. I mean, Tucker Carlson, he had a, you know, when he listened to him talk about UFOs, he believes there's, you know, evil spirits in the world. Um, and so that I reject just because I believe in the enlightenment and I don't believe in, you know, magic spirits um, fighting on this earth. Um, and, but then I think the question you're, I think your question is sort of getting at is more along the lines of like, how much should we think, um, our opponents are, uh, uh motiv just motivated by bad things or they have evil instincts and how much should we just think that they're making mistakes? And that's, you know, that's a more, that's a more complicated question. I, I don't, I think right left is too crude. Like I don't, I dislike that, but if you want to like, just make it a, you know, just sort of. Uh, zoom in a little bit more. That's like too, you know, it's it's, the, it's too high level of right left capitalists versus socialists, right? Egalitarians versus anti egalitarians. These things sometimes cross, you know, right left lines. If you do that, you know, I, I'm more comfortable saying no. Just some people are just directionally wrong, and you should not be listening to them. Right, and and then I guess I wonder if you have sympathy to the idea that like are Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson just directionally right on some things or a bunch of things that even though they're literally wrong. It's, I mean, it's any, I mean, but they could. I mean, anyone could be directionally right on some things. Yes, I mean, everyone is Kendi Ibram Kendi directionally right on some things. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I really, is, he, is he directionally right on things that are helpful or instructive or that we should follow? I, I, I don't know for Kendi, but like, does is Jones was he early to identify like a cabal of elites who are pedophile? I'm just teasing about the pedophile, but <laughs> <laughs> who are controlling things and like mandating like. You know, was he directionally right on some key things that thus, you know, mm. I, I, do you take yeah, the I mean, but not literally point? 
Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a contrast to the intellectual yet idiot. Look, I mean, I, I mean, I believe Edward Kennedy is. Look, I can make the case for Edward Kennedy. I mean, he he believes in sort of secularism. He believes in the Enlightenment. He doesn't think his opponents are literal demons. Um, you know, he doesn't. Uh, he's not a you know a crazy a crazy person who wants to. Uh, you know, regulate people's, you know, uh, decisions about, you know, whether they can eat lab grown meat or these other weird right wing cultural sort of things that they want to do. So yeah, Abram Kennedy is directionally right. I could find ways that I could find, I could pick, I could pick and choose policy areas where I think Alex Jones is directionally right. Um, that he, you know, that I agree with. Uh, I think that they're, I think that the, the, what Tucker and I think Alex Jones represent, and you know, you could pick and say, oh, they're right about this or they're wrong about that. They represent fundamentally a conspiratorial, um, worldview. And I think that's just wrong. I think this just sort of melts the brain. Um, and I don't think that's, I, I just don't think it's good epistemology. I don't, I think that they're, you know, wrong on a lot of things. They just get their basic facts wrong about like who, what, where, and why, what happened. And then their view that sort of elites are sort of all in cahoots and pushing society in a certain direction and to give sort of planning to this idea and to sort of tie in transgender policy. Well, you know, it's like a Tucker rant will be like, you know, they call you racist for not wanting immigration. And then they change your, the, tell your son to change his sex. And then they ship them off to Ukraine to go and fight for Zelensky. And it's like, it's so stupid. I mean, just thinking like this, you're just, your brain is rotted and you're like not understanding the world. You're just, you're, you're, you're literally a crazy conspiracy theorist. And we used to, we used to stigmatize that. Um, and we should stigmatize this type of thinking. No, no, directionally right. No, it's, it's it's a stupid worldview, and it should be called what it is. Do, do you sympathize with the idea that or the mistake that they make when they talk about these conspiracies is that they, to your point, they um, ascribe too much order to it or too much planning to it, but it doesn't discount that maybe via like emergent collusion, some of these things are actually happening. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. So like, what do you, what do you mean? Like emergent collusion, these things are like, oh, what, like, what does that mean in concrete terms? So it's, it's not like there is a group of people, although sometimes there is, <laughs> but a group of people who are determining sort of, uh, you know, let's say something like um, sort of the critical race theory stuff or the transgender stuff, I t- take some of the biggest complaints that the, the right has over the, you know, and we'll take out Ukraine for, for, for this one, but maybe some of the more social stuff um, that the left has been pushing um, and they might say, Hey, it's this cabal of people who's deciding everything. Um, but actually in, in some ways it is sort of a minority of the country speaking up or sort of dictating, you know, stuff on, on behalf, or I guess, do you not take the cathedral to be an instructive view of how sort of, uh, society operates in some ways, or there's this like loose affiliation between media mm-hmm. activity and government? Yeah, I mean, they have affiliations. Like, yes, I mean, okay, there's a left wing media and there's left wing activists, and left wing people sort of have bad ideas. I mean, we could, we could, like, you could talk about that, and, you know, that's uh, largely true. Um, I've never understood, like, calling it the cathedral. I, I've never, like, understood what that label does for you, how that helps sort of sharpen your thinking or, like, clarify things. Um, and you know, it's, 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 it's too much. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I don't think it leads to good places. I mean, I think you be, you become an idiot. You become easily manipulable. Someone could come along and say, they're trying to take away your stakes and they're trying to, you know, sterilize you with Klaus Schwab and you'll go and you'll ban lab growth. You'll do anything. I mean, you'll do anything if, as long as someone can wrap it up in one of these culture war discussions. So yeah, I don't think it's helpful for understanding the world. I don't think it, I think it makes people sort of dumb and it, it just sort of makes them, you know, less effective and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, undertaking bad policy. I'm, I'm just not a fan of this stuff. I'm trying to find a, you know, a way to sort of be sympathetic. Okay, I mean, I really see how I could sort of, I could justify it in my way. I, I, I can't justify it in epistemological grounds that it's actually getting at truth. But I can't justify it as maybe it's a way to motivate people. Like maybe it's like a way to, uh, you know, like I think that the Trump cult in the Republican Party, it's actually quite, you know, it's quite uh, an electoral advantage. I mean, if you have a hundred percent of people, they're all going to say every single, uh, every single indictment or everything he's been charged with or everything they say about him, they're going to take the line. You know that it's bad. I mean, that is that's impressive. That's an impressive level of sort of uh, discipline. And maybe people need a, a, a wider narrative. You don't have Christianity, and you you know that even on the right, you don't have Christianity as sort of a, a unifying theological view. Um, but you need something, and maybe just like the leftists are, are you know, evil people all 
pointing in the same direction and doing evil things, maybe that motivates activism, that motivates people to give money. And if you want Republicans to win, maybe it makes sense. So yeah, there, there, there's pro- perhaps a, a practical case for this. But I do think it help, hurts. We talked about the human capital problem. I do think it's repulsive to high human capital. So you have to sort of balance all these things. Yeah, I mean, would you say that Elon has become more conspiratorial in the last uh, you know year or so? And do you think that's a negative development or mm. a, a positive one? Yeah, I don't know. I think Elon, I mean, he's sometimes sort of, you know, I don't know, a little bit maybe sloppy. I, I don't know if he's he's um, he's conspiratorial. I'm trying to think back if I if I remember him saying anything. Did you, can you think of an example of this? Yeah, so, I mean, what are things he's rallied around? He, he's, you know, t- uh, 1350 posting, crime stuff, uh, immigration. Yeah. He's yeah, big yeah, on that. Well, okay, yeah, he, he does He does go into the, yeah, this this stuff about... Big white um, replacement, big replacement theory. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. That, that, that stuff I would consider pretty close to a conspiracy theory. I mean, especially he says, oh, they're just importing voters. I mean, I think he might have said so Biden could win, which is like, it's not, they're not going to be here and voting soon enough to, to help Biden win. <laughs> so I don't know if Elon said this or he was like responding, you know, positively to someone who said that but i do remember something like that um and so yeah i do think i do think he is a little bit you know he's he keeps his head better than a lot of people i've seen him you know go against right wingers on uh, you know immigration parts of immigration i saw him you know defend uh uh even defend euthanasia uh, to a certain extent i mean he, he does he's not completely uh brain melted um it's hard to be on twitter and sort of have strong political opinions and yeah. not sort of uh just buy into some crazy things yeah, some people will will post sort of uh, things that maybe looked like they were conspiracies, like you know, ten, fifteen years ago, that like you know, gay marriage could lead to sort of uh, what's what happened with trans, or some of the race stuff could you know, DEI could lead to BLM or things like yeah. that. I well, guess. I mean, the, the, no, that's a good example of like how the, this is a sort of an error because they say, yeah, gay marriage you know leads to trans. Okay, you can say some of that. There's a lot of the gay marriage opponents predicted a lot of crazy things and not all of them happened i mean they're sex with animals pedophilia like they, they think pedophilia is everywhere i mean they think pedophilia is about to be legalized i mean i, I don't <laughs> see evidence of that and so yeah i mean the, these people i mean they might have some hits but they also have a lot of misses and then yeah. sort of selective in what they remember it's like the economist who predicts like uh you know eight of the last two recessions or something yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> the um i mean it's still early pedophilia could uh what would they call it maps now um i forget what the term stands for but yeah uh, minor yeah. attracted persons yeah. i've seen see. this like i looked into it it's like one academic it's not like any state has like made this a category it's weird the pedophilia thing is funny because they're going in the opposite direction they're saying age gaps you know are it's like you can't even consent to sex if you're 25 if the you know your partner yeah. is 45 and so they're going in the opposite direction i mean it's like not even adults can consent to sex anymore <laughs> so i don't know how, how close we are to pedophilia yeah. It's uh, anarcho- anarcho-tyranny, but for, for sex, if it's the right, uh, you know, minority I'm sh- or right person, I'm sure, you know, them at 16 is going to be fine at some point. There'll be a Greta Thunberg-like character who is, uh, you know, 16 and wants to just have sex. Yeah, I mean, the, you saw the New York, they went after the French because the French have a sort of lower age of consent. I forgot what it was, but it was much, it was lower than the U.S. And like, and culturally, like people in their memoirs would say they had sex with teenage girls. And there was a big thing in the New York Times, like, oh my God, can you believe the French are doing this? And I think they you know, under the pressure, they started denouncing all the people who had these, you know, uh, uh, experiences with underage girls. So like there was, we had an example of them, like canceling a culture for being too, too quote unquote, you know, friendly to pedophiles as if you, in the, yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't even call that pedophilia 15 years ago. I mean, with the expansion of what we call pedophilia, um, is really another story here, but no, we're going in the opposite. I mean, pedophilia, <laughs> we are, we are as far away from that as possible. Um, let me, tie up some loose ends before before we wrap here so on, on the jew point someone told me recently this interesting idea that jews just tend to be the best activists like for all sides whether it's left-wing right-wing yeah. anti-semite pro-israel libertarian marxist capitalist just jews are the best arguers and they tend to be yeah. um, activists on, on all sides and, and thus this is why maybe they tend to be less conservative they're always trying to change change things mm-hmm. um yeah I, Any yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're even that underrepresented. I mean, if you take the class of intellectuals and you take all the white Christian intellectuals and all the uh, Jewish intellectuals are of the last, say, 100 years, um, are the Jewish intellectuals to the left? I don't know, because you look at like uh, the free market economists, uh, Mer- like uh, Milton Friedman, right? Like a uh, Richard Posner, like law and economics, uh, the, the entire Mises Institute, uh, these Hayek, uh, Hayek was Hayek Jewish? No, I think Hayek actually wasn't Jewish. Someone correct me uh, on that. Um, but a lot of the sort of the free, uh, Ayn Rand, I mean, a lot of these free market economists and philosophers 
Um, they were, uh, you know, they, they, they were themselves Jewish. Yeah, I think that, you know, I had a article, uh, The Great Jewish Realignment of 2023. And all you have to assume is Jews are higher on verbal IQ and they care more about politics, right? And I just think there's, uh, you know, I, 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 there is just this sort of, and I think Arabs are like this too, where there's just like more interest in politics, just more interest in sort of broad abstract ideas. I don't think it's a coincidence. This is sort of, um, you know, this, this connection is maybe sort of um, um, uh, maybe not, you know, obvious to people, but I've always believed this, that sort of, it's not a coincidence that the three major, you know, the, the major uh, monotheistic religions that sort of spread to the rest of the world all came from the Middle East. Um, I think there's something about that region where people like to fortunes and argue and you look at something like a country like Lebanon and Syria, they've got like this dizzying array of like 10 different religious groups who all, all hate each other. And the Jews have their roots in this part of the world and they come to the West and they're dominating, you know, every um, ideological sort of uh, faction, even the anti-Semites. Ron Unz is, you know, one of the smartest anti-Semites now is himself, a, is, is himself Jewish. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there there is something to this um, idea that, you know, once you had sort of, you have free, it's emerged from a free society. Yeah, Jews were going to dominate sort of the intellectual space. Yeah. Um, two more questions and we'll get out of here. One is Silicon Valley, uh, Alexander Wang, CEO of Scale AI, just tweeted about how he's going to not hire based on DEI and just purely on merit. And a lot of other CEOs are starting to step forward as well. Um, do you think that we should operate like France where we don't even sort of track sort of gaps or, or, or racial categories when it comes to hiring or you had this post interesting post where you talked about how black nationalism is the on, only sort of um, thing that actually matters when it comes to, to DEI. I guess, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I wrote a piece, uh, you know, uh, uh, something about the French, you know, uh, colorblindness is like a second best solution. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if government needs to enforce it, but uh, a norm that you don't even think about racial statistics. And yeah, government is actually the, the source of a lot of these uh, statistics that get counted as sort of evidence of discrimination. And so, yeah, that's one of my, um, that's one of the arguments of my book that like, we should just not be counting this stuff and sort of what we count ends up being what we uh, focus on. So the government for, you know, historically contingent reasons doesn't uh, count uh, religion and like how many uh, Protestants or Catholics or so forth are in any particular job. And we don't count different categories of white people or different kinds of Hispanics. And people don't care about those disparities. We care specifically about race uh, because of a specific history of the uh, Civil Rights Act and the way that, you know, the decisions that were made bureaucratically in the 1960s and 1970s. And yes, it would be better if we just got away from these classifications as much as possible. Yeah. What, um, What's your 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 most recent book? Of course, the the origin of woke. Um, what's your next book going to be about, or what are some of the big intellectual topics that um, you're looking forward to spending a lot more time on? Yeah, I mean, I'm interested. One of the things I'm really interested in is like the the degree to which America works, like the degree to which it works, even though you have a lot of reasons for thinking it shouldn't work. Uh, you know, high crime rate. Uh, inner cities are just like completely, you know, war zones, um, elites that are sort of dumb. And, you know, po we see politicians are just very stupid and they all hate each other and great polarization. Um, and somehow this country just keeps working. I mean, our, our economic engine is sort of the envy of the world. We're growing much faster than anyone else in Europe. Um, and, you know, we're demographically healthier. And, you know, culturally, I think we still dominate and we're still important in international institutions, even though, you know, relatively, you're probably going to lose power over time. And I have some theories about why this works, and I've touched on this a little bit. Um, and I think that sort of this dynamic tension within society uh, is healthy. I actually think that a lot of these things that seem like weaknesses, like the political polarization and uh, sort of like the, you know, the, the the low quality of people going into politics and maybe a few other things, and even even like some of the violence and like, you know, the, the, the drug use, I think these things are sort of re related to sort of our dynamism and our ability to sort of resilience as a society. So I don't know if that'll be a book, but, you know, I, I'll probably have a, a couple essays on that and see how it goes. It's interesting. It's, it's sometimes hard to know whether we're succeeding in spite of something or or because of it. Yeah, yeah. It's not much. It's not. It's not. It doesn't get enough. It doesn't get enough thought. I mean, we really, especially the last three four years, the American economy versus Europe. I mean, it's just such a 
uh, you know, such a, such a difference in performance. And yeah, there's not enough, you know, there's not enough thought about this. I mean, this is something that yeah, people should understand and we should try, you know, can help us sort of cultivate. I think some of the things people want to do, they might, um, you know, they, they often want more order. They want to bring, you know, like uh, Fred Brian Chow says, what, what has chaos and needs more order? What has more order and needs more chaos? People keep trying to bring more order to America. Maybe, maybe the chaos is the strength. Yeah, fascinating. The um, by the way, just on an on immigration, um, is your view that we should? You know, Brian Kaplan is a is an open borders person. You you mentioned how he um, influenced your worldview. Are you an open borders person, or are you of the view that our immigration policy should be that of a a, a, a company, which is if the if the person is good for our society, net positive, we should take them in, um, and if they're not, we should not. Which would then you know you could then from there imply that like U.S. You know, immigrants are actually pretty good for for what we got going on here, but Europe actually does have an immigration problem um, in terms of the people that are you know immigrating and and how they're immigrating and how they're not assimilating and the sort of human capital. Or or do you think that Europe immigration problems are actually overstated? And are you an open borders person or sympathetic to that? Yeah, I uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not like a big into like i don't know, like open borders. It, it's such a, it's such a, uh, you know, I, I don't identify with that because it's, it, it always has to depend on historical context and it always has to depend on sort of the nature of the immigrants and how many and what exactly is happening in the world. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll say sort of directionally which way I think American policy should be. I think American policy uh, should be more open uh, to immigration uh, because I think a lot of the problems are exaggerated. I think that, you know, a bigger, a bigger country, a bigger economy, I think we need low skilled labor. I think that there's no evidence that this is, you know, a bad thing or hurting the, uh, hurting the country or there's very little evidence of that. And the crime wave that they keep predicting from immigrants, you know, these dangerous military age males, immigrants go to cities and the crime rate pretty much always goes down. Um, and so in the U.S., you know, I think we have a healthy mix. Uh, in Europe, it's a little bit, it's different because a lot of these, uh, you know, you look at the crime rate between, uh, you know, North Africans and, and native uh, French, um, and you look at sort of the cultural differences, and you look at sort of, the, you know, the societal tensions. They seem a lot realer than what we have in the United States. Now, in Germany, I mean, there was a lot of Syrians that came around, you know, 2015, and it doesn't seem to have worked out too badly. France, it seems to not have worked out as uh, as well. Um, but yeah, I, I generally am more sympathetic to, to more immigration, although I understand that there are certain circumstances where, um, you, you know, you could have too much. I do want, I, I think like, you know, ideally like one country would, <laughs> one or two countries in Europe would just have completely closed borders and then just in case like, you know, somehow it, it just, you know, destroys everything. Like, I don't think that's a high possibility, but whatever, like Hungary. Okay. You could be to yourself. You're not that great. <laughs> not like people like it. <laughs> and, you know, it's good. If, if it works out and people love hungry and it turns out to be a great success for that, yeah, we'll all learn something. Yeah. L last question. What would you say to a imagined critique that says that you're something of like, a, uh, that you overvalue the importance of IQ and maybe undervalue the importance of common sense? Like if you take, I don't know, I'm trying to think to, to quote unquote extreme people, uh, like uh, Tucker Carlson on the right and for lack of a better word, like, one, like a Will Wilkinson on the left, uh, obviously – you know, I should say, obviously, or maybe the Alex Jones on the right, you know, Tucker Carl, sorry, Will Wilkinson is, is probably much higher IQ than a, than a, than an Alex Jones. Um, and thus I would take his, you know, perspective more seriously on maybe economic perspectives, although, although he's leftist, so maybe that's the wrong analogy, but, but probably less so on like social, like basically, I guess, do you take seriously the Nassim Taleb, like intellectual yet idiot, like, you know, sometimes high IQ people just come up with just dumb yeah. ideas or policies, but common sense people, just have you yeah. know st or street smart this idea they don't understand they, they might use terms like demons or something but they have just like a basic understanding of how things should operate or <laughs> feel free to push back on this yeah slide. i don't i don't think i i love iq as much as uh that that critique uh suggests like i'm not a big fan of uh yeah these people that like you know aporia if you read that magazine they have a thing about how great china is because they only select the high iq leaders and i was criticizing that article a lot that's the best argument against iq i've ever seen the way that Ch china is run and you know it's a high iq society with high iq leaders and it, it, it's not good i mean there's 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 bad things in that selection uh process um yeah i mean i mean i if you, like i don't know why you have to go to alex jones or tucker carlson just like a normal businessman who built like 
well, maybe maybe these people are all Alex Jones fans at this point in time. <laughs> but twenty years ago, they were not. They were more sane, and they had this sort of you know salt of the earth American common sense. And like to take them over, like a you know uh, you know sociology professor, like yeah, that's great. I mean, the problem is you know those people all became Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson fans, and somehow they became crazier than the, the than the intellectuals. Now it depends on the issue, and it depends on exactly which intellectual you're talking about, uh, and and so forth. But yeah, I don't just you know sort of blindly worship. You know, whatever group has the highest IQ, they should they should rule us. I mean, there are very specific problems to the left uh, that come from not low IQ, but I think some really bad assumptions about the world um, and some really bad moral values. And then you have on the right, you have your own problems. Like some of them are just you know the, the, they have a scam problem. They have a sort of more mac- lax moral standards. If you're going to compare say to conservative media space compared to the liberals, and yes, you know, uh, not being as smart is going to um, have a, uh, you know, is going to have some negative uh, impacts on your uh, sort of um, the mini culture culture that you build. Um, but, you know, I see it like any other trade, not the be all and end all of human existence. Okay. A- actual last question. Give, <laughs> give me a couple of minutes on what you think about for the future of, of the right and the left in a post Biden or Trump world, whether that's t- 2028 or uh, whenever these guys die, um, yeah. uh, you know, assume Trump wins 2024 and then he dies by 2028 or something um like do you have uh, thoughts on on how these parties evolve yeah i mean the biden thing is interesting i mean i think the demo each side has this sort of uh you know the question is how much the democrats can hold so okay so i think i've made this analogy before i might have even made it uh on this show where trump is like the sun Right, it's like it's like a gravitational force in our solar system. And like you remove the sun, like how is Jupiter relative to Mars? Like it's like okay, you've, you've, you you all the rules don't apply to where he's such a, an amazing force of nature, right? And so it's hard to sort of predict what happens when Trump goes away. I don't think he goes away for a while. I think he's still he's got to be you know if he loses in 2034, I've always said he'll 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 run and win the nomination in 2028, and otherwise he'll be a president. And then he'll be um, he'll leave office in uh, 2028 if he wins, and he'll go uh, 2029, and he'll be uh, uh, put on trial. <laughs> the trials will be still be the center of Republican uh, politics, right? So you know he's not going away for a while. Um, I do think okay, so yeah, we can start with the Republicans. There's, I, I sort of think it would go back to normal i mean nikki haley ended up being pretty much second place she went you know she did better than ron DeSantis, and then just maybe everyone who liked DeSantis liked trump but i think that like you know before trump it was like you always had these crazy people within the republican party you know but they didn't um have someone to coalesce around he was just such a focal point uh that they all would, would call us around and like if you take that away you end up with a problem you end up with an issue where like the established with Nikki Haley types are a lot smarter and a lot more competent and can sort of co-opt um, the sort of, you know, nationalist um, uh, sort of conspir- more conspiratorial uh, right. So Ted Cruz was in second place in 2016. He's sort of, he's a person who straddles these two worlds, um, but mostly I, I would say is more of a movement conservative uh, type from that perspective. Um, and then in 2024, you had Nikki Haley was in second place. It could be just like Nikki Haley could be, you know, the most likely nominee in 2028. I don't think that's I'm like, I don't think it's necessarily DeSantis. I think it, it, charisma ends up mattering a lot more. Um, so whoever ends up winning, it's going to be, I think, Kelly's a, just a more likable candidate to more people than DeSantis is. Um, and so, yeah, you could just see sort of a normalization, like like normal as in like crazy, <laughs> like Republicans are crazy, but like the establishment is sort of in control and then, uh, you know, adopt some things like co-op some things from uh, the the nationalist right, like uh, uh, you know, on immigration, on wokeness, and and so forth. Uh, Nikki Haley, you know, when she ran for, um, she opened the, her uh, presidential campaign. She had a video where she said wokeness is you know the greatest threat to America or something. I mean, like you know, people think of Nikki Haley as establishment, but no, she's like talking like DeSantis uh, on these things. Um, and so that you know that battle within the Republican Party is is one. Um, okay, and so the Democrats, I mean, they're an interesting place in that. Their most talented politicians seem to be more moderate, um, and so they got, you know they still have at the state level the ability, and Republicans have this too. Like state governance tends to work better, where they have these govern governors who don't come across as crazy people who are far left on like abortion, which you can be because pretty op- public opinion is is pretty left wing. Um, they're usually a little bit more pro Israel than the Democratic norm, and they're you know slightly more friendly to business um, than the Democratic norm. 
And so I'm thinking of, uh, you know, they're sort of neoliberals or they're probably the people who read, you know, Iglesias or their staff reads Iglesias or whatever, right? So it's like Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, Gretchen Whitmer um, in Michigan, uh, Gavin Newsom, a little bit more left wing, but, you know, he, he sort of presents as a sort of very moderate guy. He talks about the freedom agenda in California. I don't think it's much freedom in the state, but, uh, you know, that's how he presents himself. And so those are like the best politicians um, on the right, I think there's, I think the, um, I think they have the upper hand. Um, I think the Gretchen Whitmer slash Newsom types over like the AOC, Corey Bush uh, types. I think those people are sort of, you know, they're, 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 they're from a different culture. I think they're the, the I think that the, that's not the majority of Democratic Party. I mean, all the Republicans have is sort of Fox News and talk radio and so forth. The Democrats have, you know, the sort of more intellectual culture of Vox and the New York Times, Washington Post. And I think that like somebody like, you know, Josh Shapiro, Gretchen Whitmer, that's, you know, p- perfect for there. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is the Democrats, when Trump is gone, Democrats are going to win every election because they have, uh, they have, uh, you know, their, their smartest uh, candidates and their more, most broadly appealing candidates uh, tend to rise to the top. And Republicans are just sort of an insane sort of free for all. And I really wonder, people think Trump hurts the Republicans. I wonder if he's the, he's the, he's the, uh, he's the dam. He's just holding back the liberal flood because he has unique talents, unique political talents and a unique appeal to large parts of the country. And importantly, a sort of unifying effect on the Republican party, which is a political advantage when he goes. I mean, I think I would be more optimistic about the Democrats in the long run. Trump as the, as the savior will, uh, will, will, will the, 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 uh, sort of, uh, the, uh, the source of stability, you know, in our politics in the Republican <laughs> Party, the only thing holding back the left left takeover. You know, the, the, I guess uh, all these people are directionally right, maybe after all. Yeah, you and Alex Jones actually agree. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, Richard, this has been a great discussion for people who enjoyed the, the conversation. Highly recommend uh, following Richard on Twitter and on Substack um, and uh, check out Richard's uh, new streaming uh, a- a- activities as well. Is there anything else you want to plug? Of course, obviously, the book Origin of Woke we covered last time, but um, anything else you want to cover? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the Twitter and the Substack are the important places. Twitter is a little bit, you know, a little less serious, but the Substack is where I uh, sort of flesh out these ideas more. So, yes, uh, you could just richardhanania.com, Twitter, Richard Hanania, very easy to find. Excellent. Richard, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Upstream with Eric Tornberg is a show from Turpentine, the podcast network behind Moment of Zen and Cognitive Revolution. If you like the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store. Hey, everyone. Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at ericaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. 